Okay, great. Uh, we're moving on now. Uh, clearly, there are a lot of uncertainties around at the moment, a lot of them political here in the, U uh, in the UK with Brexit, in the US, the new president. We're going to be talking about all these things now. Our uh, moderator, Mr. Christopher Paulson, head of consultancy, Lloyd's List Intelligence. Christopher, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, we're going to cover pretty much everything that is an uncertainty in the world uh, currently, uh, and that is uh, nothing I'm going to do by myself. I have a very distinguished panel to help me out. Jonathan Roberts, Head of Communications, UK Chamber of Shipping. I have uh, Martin Kakavan, Chairman of the Executive Committee of the UK Chamber of Shipping, uh, sorry, the Turkish Chamber of Shipping. I had uh, Lord Mount Evans. He's uh, chairman of pretty much everything. Maritime London, board member of the Maritime UK. I looked into you see the past CV and I noticed one very distinguished uh, uh, thing there, that they're actually born and raised in the same city that I live in, which is Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, well done. Um, and then we have uh, Mr. Mark Tuck, partner of uh, Watson, Farley and Williams. So... Um, we're going to divide this into two parts, I would say. Let's, let's start with uh, new political uncertainties in, uh, outside of the UK. And uh, I think that we're going to start with uh, what we could refer to from now on as Trumponomics. Uh, in the uh, electoral uh, campaign, uh, the rhetoric was very, very protectionistic, you could say. Uh, Donald, uh, Donald Trump threatened to tear up pretty much every trade agreement in existence and to replace it by something else. He also said that he would support the U.S. energy industries, the mining industries, the car industries, uh, and to me it's a, a bit uh, interesting to note that much of the U.S. trade is very much made up of the exports out of these industries. So that, to me, suggests that there might be a balancing act here somewhere in the future. Now, um, he has already set out at a great pace. Uh, he has uh, um, teared up TPP. Uh, I'm sure he will do the same with the TTIP. Uh, and what happens to NAFTA remains to be seen. Now, uh, TPP was in place very much to protect the U.S. from China. Now it's uh, removed and to replace by something we don't know yet. Now, uh, uh, Knut Magnussen mentioned quite a lot about the potential development of this, but uh, dear distinguished panel, what, oh, oh, is President Trump actually putting right in the hands of China, and what would that have as an impact uh, on, on the uh, world trade going forward and the demand for seaborne trade? Uh, it's a general question, but I think I'll start with, with uh, Jonathan Roberts, if you could uh, have just a few thoughts about this. Sure. I, I think the first thing to understand is that globalization isn't dying. There's been quite a lot of, I think, hyperbole um, over the last, well, year or so, really. Globalization is changing, but whatever the peaks and troughs of the shipping markets may be, um, we are trade. we've never really traded more as a species. Um, but globalization is changing. Um, we've seen that uh, Trump is moving away from multilateral deals towards bilateral deals. There's a certain rationale to that, by the way. You know, um, uh, numerous countries negotiating with each other is going to be always much more difficult than bilateral arrangements. And we've seen that uh, Theresa May, particularly Liam Fox in the UK, actually um, uh, agree with that. But US protectionism isn't particularly new. We understand the Jones Act and, and so on. But we are in a slightly bizarre situation now where last week at Davos, the Chinese Premier uh, was the one, more so than any other, who seemed to be defending global capitalism. Um, uh, the irony of, of which not lost on, on, on many people. One thing to remember, and I started by saying, um, you, know, uh, you know, the hyperbole gets, you know, people get carried away with it, is that a lot of what D Donald Trump would want requires congressional approval. And that requires debate, and it requires amendments, and ultimately it means he does not have the complete authority to do exactly what he wants. We, we're not going to find out the exact nature of those arrangements for, I think, a reasonable time. Precisely. Anyone else would like to comment on that, Lord Mount Evans? Yes, I mean, I think that um, 
you know, this move in the U.S. comes at a time when China is suddenly going extremely international. Um, you know, that's one thing. So that I think to go back to your point, I think to some extent there is a possibility they're rather playing into the hands of China's ambitions. Um, I think it's also, uh, in, if we're looking from a shipping perspective, um, one of the interesting things that struck me is that, um, uh, you know, uh, Citibank... Well, first of all, China, the focus... I was in China in September. The focus of China is, is on the Belt and Road, which is kind of, uh, you know, particularly to uh, the West, but not really to the U.S. It's, it's to um, East, Central, West... Uh, Asia, um, Mediterranean, and so on. Um, so you have that great initiative going on from China at this time. Another point which is worth mentioning is that Citibank uh, did some work, I think, saying that in 2030, um, the biggest trade corridor for shipping would be um, uh, developed Asia, Japan, Korea, China, into, into developing Asia, like sort of Malaysia, Indonesia, and so on. Um, so that that... Uh, you know, for, those, for a shipping audience like that, that's another interesting aside of this, but that's what I'm going to say at the moment. Thank you. Yes. Um, um, I read this morning that uh, Japan's exports to China jumped 12.5% last year. Excuse me. May I comment on this, Trump? Uh, absolutely. Uh, actually, thanks to God, a leader came to stop China. It's uh, uh, fundamentally... Uh, Chinese fundamentals, we, cons we produce, you consume. I mean, if you look at it from the shipping perspective, maybe short run, it will negative effect. But for the future, definitely it will be world and the shipping benefit. This means, yes, nationalistic approach, but at least every country could produce something for themselves. Otherwise, if you do not put these fundamentals in line, they will take over one by one every sector. So this is the big chance for the world, and I believe one way or the other, uh, it will continue. As the infrastructure investments, the producing, yes, globalization will take some effect. It was already online, um, could you talk about globalization of the China? Um, do you know it's, uh, there is over 100% financing in China for the new shipbuilding? And if I ask the question, anybody with the soft financing, 100%, 90% of the audience will say yes, we order. Indeed. So I, I see uh, Trump is a chance. Uh, it's uh, really, it's, uh, and I hope uh, fundamentally, Europe could not manage this, the others not, but uh, US could do it. Thank you. So there is a, a sort of a hope to be attached to, 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 to Trumponomics here. Um, India uh, is meeting, and President Modi of India is meeting with Apple to discuss manufacturing, and that uh, is an indication of where we're going in another direction. Moving to the energy industry and, and, and Trumponomics, um, uh, the, the development of shale gas and tight oil in the, in the past 10, 12 years has, of course, been a major shift in global trade and um, incitement to quite a lot of uh, development. Now, uh, uh, yesterday, again, uh, President Trump greenlit the, the, the Keystone Pipeline with access to, uh, access to Dakota to that one, which, of course, would benefit Canadian production, I would assume. Now, what will OPEC's uh, response be? They've just decided, well, gave a signal that they are agreeing on something. Well, will they cheat, as they always do? Uh, will they continue? Uh, will this erode the potential comeback of the oil price? I know these are difficult questions, but you are uh, smart people, so uh, who would like to have a first go? Oh, you're looking at each other now, so... Well, I, I haven't spoken yet, so why don't I be the starter for 10? I mean, it, this is a, a sector that I follow, but not, not incredibly closely, so there will be no doubt some in the audience who uh, take my comments as fairly uninformed. But, you know, as... As a, a partially active uh, player in the sector, you know, with a, an interventionist and protectionist president now in the U.S., 
um, who's, who's, who's thrown a grenade in and, and thrown his weight and support behind US production of, of shale gas and, and tight oil. Um, from where I sit, that can only undermine the oil price. Um, it seems to me that OPEC have just come out of you know, a rather damaging for, for all parties, but for them, uh, standoff or fight uh, with the US over oil prices. <coughs> Um, they didn't manage to starve out the, the shale oil and tight oil industry uh, in the U.S. as they'd hoped. I would personally be surprised if they step back up into that fight, uh, particularly in, in quite the way that they have done over the last two years. Um, it remains to be seen what President Trump's support for the industry actually translate to in, in practical actions. Um, like a lot of his statements during his campaign, you know, he's bombastic, um, he's opportunistic, um, but also he's not stupid. Um, and you know, he, he has uh, an experienced team around him. He has a team that's not entirely internal looking and protectionist. There are lots of, uh, lots of businessmen there on his team um, who have a global outlook and who will not want those interests uh, to be damaged. Um, so. You know, like, like so many of these things, it remains to be seen, but I suspect that it won't be um, either at the worst of what we could imagine or indeed the best. It will be somewhere in the middle. Yes. Uh, let's stick to the Middle East uh, for a while, um, which is a sensitive region and is also a region which is the source of much of, uh, of seaborne trade, particularly, of course, tanker trades. Uh, the, the, uh, some of the sanctions for, for Iranian exports have been lifted. Uh, we, uh, last year we saw, saw exports out of Iran more than double in, uh, in a very, very short period of time, back to the pre, pre-embargo uh, levels. Now, uh, the move to, uh, of, uh, again, the, the threat to move uh, the uh, U.S. embassy in, from Tel Aviv to, to Jerusalem is seen as very provocative. Is this the first of many steps like that? How can that shift the balance of recovery to stability? We have we have just seen that Russia, Iran, and Turkey has now uh, stepped up to, to to monitor ceasefire in Syria. And and what is Turkey's role in this? And uh, I think uh, the the, the uh, panelist that uh, could be the first one to, to have a view on this is is Metin. Uh, thank you. It's, uh... It's a uh, uh, current uh, presentation. Uh, there was uh, seven uh, uh, clauses uh, regarding, uh, but the last one was the uh, terrorism was inside in the seventh uh, effect cause. But to me, it's not the last one. It's the first one. For the world, it's, uh, in this area is uh, more terrorism, I mean, terrorism center, nearly. It's, uh, but who is the, doing this? And why is happening? Uh, who is problem? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, when we look at the world growth, the first effect is terrorism. The world is not normalized anymore. It's uh, trying to come to normalize, but uh, every people, comparing 10 years ago, it's uh, afraid in, consume, to go, to move, to visit, look at the Paris uh, or Istanbul or Brussels or everywhere, not very safe. So it's, uh, uh, when we look at uh, what is going on over there, yes, it's a uh, great uh, uh, plans, the uh, world uh, cold war situation is again come out, uh, uh, US and Russia, it's down, uh, I mean, things are not as you see, as you hear, as you watch. Just coming to you, it's uh, as it should be seen and watched. So it's uh, there is a big fight, and the Turkey is the key. We are one of the country having debt, and maybe we are not so rich on the money-wise, asset-wise. But we are the richest country on the conscious. We have three millions of immigrants. We are sharing whatever we have in our hands. And some countries, specifically the West, 
with the blood industry of the weapons industry and having and growing but uh, affecting a lot of cows towns what you asked yeah it will never stop over there because it's big economy and we are facing we are the guardians of the europe if we are not doing our job correctly there will be millions coming to the europe so at this place it's really it's one of the core problematic area and uh, by God, uh, we are near over there as a job politically. We are over there. Geographically, we are over there. But uh, really, it's, uh, it's amazing. When we had the coup attempt in the 2016, 246 people died. Nobody was with us as a leader. But we were in Paris, in the other areas. So when we look at this, yes, we, are, we see 2016 is fantastic, valuable year for Turkey, and we see who is our alliance, friends, real friends. Most of them are acting as an actor, saying we are good, best, they are not. So it's, uh, this is affecting the world trade, yep. seaborne trade, so it's, it's a conflict, but it's affecting, it's one of the uh, negative reasons of the world trade, why not growing as it should be with the near, nearly zero interest of money, a lot of money. So it's, uh, uh, I am very proud to be a Turkish citizen because we are the richest as a conscious of the country and taking a lot of people. So it's, uh, uh, it's not easy. It will not uh, settle down easily, but uh, we will see a lot of movements of the US and the Russia down. It will continue. Uh, let's uh, park that for a while and maybe in, uh, if we have time left uh, we return to that because there is much more to be said about that uh, and, and move over to, to something closer to home uh, uh, the Brexit issue um, if you look at, uh, if you look at um, UK trade in a global perspective then of course uh, the United Kingdom is not really that world power that it once was it has about 1 to 3% as a share of world trade in tonnage terms, uh, unless uh, expect for the, uh, except for in the general cargo. And much of that trade, in, in turn, is with the EU. So Brexit is, of course, a very, very relevant discussion to have here. Um, in your view, and uh, I'd like to hear from, uh, I think I'd start with, start with Lord Mount Evans, you know, what, uh, what would, do you think would be the terms of trade effect for the United Kingdom going forward of Brexit? Well, um, actually, I've never been particularly good on terms of trade, believe it or not. But I think that, um, you know, what has strikes me very much about what's happening is that uh, the government and business are extremely focused on making a success of this. Mm -hmm. So that I think that whilst it has injected uncertainty into everything, um, I think I've been really impressed from work I do with the maritime industries and government and in other theatres. By the way, uh, uh, government is very focused on making the UK an extremely competitive place to do business. Mm -hmm. So that um, I'm actually rather, although I was a rather passionate Remainer, um, I have to say that, you know, this is a situation we will make a success of it. And, um, you know, what is impressing me very much is the government focus on it. Yeah. Jonathan? Well, it's been 240 years since Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, and in it he descri describes how trade operates on the principle of mutual benefit. We trade with each other because it's in our mutual interest to do so. And a couple of centuries later, nothing has really changed, certain, certainly philosophically. Um, and I think that will be the guiding principle. We're going to hear lots of speeches and we're going to get lots of press releases and heaven knows we're going to get lots of leaks, some of them genuine and some of them not so. But ultimately when the negotiators are around the table, uh, they'll be operating on that basis. Now, what is the UK's hand? Well, the UK has a significant trade deficit. 
with uh, the rest of the European Union. About 20 years ago, um, about 60% of our trade was with the European Union. It's now around 44% had uh, Brexit not taken place. Uh, it was already projected to be down to somewhere in the mid-30s uh, in the next uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, I think that um, both sides will reflect particularly on uh, the customs union elements of it, erecting um, physical barriers to trade. I think it will be, um, uh, you know, to have the sort of operation stack issue that we had uh, with, the, with the strikes and so on a year, a year or two ago, where trade could not physically move through, um, move through the port. Were that to return, that would be uh, devastating, but it, it would be devastating on both sides, and that's why I don't think that, uh, that it will happen. So certainly if we are to leave the customs union, which I suspect we will, uh, Theresa May has essentially said that we will, um, I think uh, the, the final arrangements will end up being something like at 80 or 90 percent what it currently is, and I suspect that will be tolerable for ports on both sides. Yeah. Um, before I <coughs> move to the others... Stop. May I comment on this? Yeah, of course. Can you keep it sh short? Because yeah, we are, we're, uh, the, we are running the, out of time. Yeah, so it's a, a lot uh, more to cover. Re regarding uh, Britain, uh, uh, it's fantastic. It will. Uh, I mean, the uh, European Union is not the Union. It's uh, 26 says yes, one says no. It's no. So it's uh, it's freedom of the uh, uh, Britain, and as a shipping, it will be positive, much positive, and uh, it, for the European Union, it will be negative effect, but in generally. This is the right decision for Britain for the future. Why is it freedom? Yes. Well, um, the regional trade is, of course, one shipping activity that potentially could be impacted from this. Uh, we're talking about railroad row packs. We're talking about general cargo shipments. Much of the industries within the region is, are served by this, and the United Kingdom is very much. Much of its imports comes on those trades. Uh, Apparently, that trade will not disappear, but the, 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 the conditions for it will change, and we could see some border implications. Uh, that, again, Jonathan, and then uh, if we move on to a little bit of the attractiveness of London as a place to do business after that, where I'd like to hear Mark's opinion. But let's, Jonathan, if you can keep it short. Sure, well, 120 billion pounds worth of trade moves through Dover alone. That was the figure uh, last year. Um, now, since the customs union was introduced in the early 1990s, the number of ferry crossings from Dover and the continent uh, have increased by 150%. That's allowed ports such as Dover to invest very heavily in their infrastructure. What they haven't needed to do and actually sort of geographically not able to do, is uh, uh, invest in their lorry parks. These are the places where the lorries used to park up uh, and wait for the paperwork to be done. Now they haven't invested in those lorry parks because they, there hasn't been any paperwork. Theoretically, you can drive straight off the motorway in, into the port, onto the ship, and off you go, and vice versa. Um, if there are significant... Uh, 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 trade barriers erected if certainly ev every truck is going to be stopped and, and, uh, and, and, and checked going into Dover. Uh, there is not the, uh, the sort of physical capacity to house those lorries and I mentioned earlier the, the operation stack. You would end up with a uh, traffic jam from Dover all the way back to, um, uh, well halfway back to London. Um, and I think that's why government is taking all of this so seriously. Uh, Lord Mount Evans uh, 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 referred to it. Every conversation we've had with the Department of Exiting the European Union, they get this more than anything else. Um, and they are uh, working on it. We've heard the speech from Theresa May last week. Um, and actually, some of our yep. conversations with our uh, European counterparts, they get this as well. And I just think that's the reason why we have uh, um, reason to be quietly confident. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be the bluster. But, yep. uh, but we'll get there. Yeah. So probably uh, longer lead times and, and um, price increases as, or cost increases as well. Now London is the, the centre to do maritime business and, and uh, uh, what services, I mean will, these, will this change? Mark, you're one of these service providers. Do you feel threatened and why? I think uh, I feel no more threatened than I, I always have. I mean, you know, Shipping is a, a, a dynamic industry, 
uh, London's connection with shipping goes back hundreds of years uh, as, a, as a, a, sh a center for shipping, you know, far longer, you know, far before the EU or the EEC was a, a twinkle in Jean Monnet's eye. So London is well used to addressing uh, the challenges that, that are thrown up. You know, banks uh, enter and exit the shipping market, uh, global trade waxes and wanes. You know, London has seen many more, many times before, and adapts and changes, and here we still are. Um, you know, as, as a lawyer, I'm you know, very good at spotting pretend, uh, protect, potential problems, uh, and certainly we can all see many potential problems uh, in the next uh, few years as we address what Brexit actually means. But I've got to say, personally, um, I'm starting to feel quite exhilarated almost by, by the process. Um, you know, to be part of a nation that is really questioning what is our place in the world, how do we want to, uh, how do we want to collaborate and, and work with our close neighbours and, and friends further afield, actually is, is a little bit of a change as far as I'm concerned to the, uh, to, to the English and, and UK psyche. Um, and, you know, there are disadvantages to, to the, having that focus, um, and there are societal impact as well. But actually, overall, I've, I've, I've found the, the, the process since, you know, like everyone, for a, a couple of days after the referendum vote, uh, I had a couple of days of, of shock. Um, but actually, it does make you look at what you do and why you do it and who you do it with. Um, and really, to, to echo some of the things that, that Jonathan said, um, you know, you, you've got to hope and trust that when it comes to the negotiating table, people hunker down and have a sensible negotiation because it's in no one's interest, either the UK's or our, our friends who will remain in the EU, to, to have a rancorous or, or disagreeable exit. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the winners from, from that situation will not be either the UK or our friends in the EU. Um, and to be honest, there may not be any real winners anywhere else. Um, so, you know, there's, there's quite a responsibility could, on people. Could you shorten this down? Okay. Because we, 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 we have, um, we, we started late, we, we have used 23 and a half of our 25 minute allotment. Lord Mount Evans has waved and wants to say something. Uh, you, you, you get the gist then. I, I, I think there's, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot to do, but it will be all right in the end because we're used to sorting out these, these sorts of issues and working hard to make it, you know, make it a good result. Yep. Uh, uh, can you keep it short, please? Yes, I mean, I, I very much endorse what Mark was saying. Um, you know, the thing about London and the UK, the maritime cluster here, is it is un. I mean, we don't have a huge uh, container activity per se, but we have very, very efficient ports. We have uh, unequaled uh, professional services, I believe. And last year when I was Lord Mayor, I visited 25 countries, 100 days overseas. People like doing business in the UK. They feel comfortable. There's a lot of trust with British professionals. So that I think, uh, you know, there's plenty of challenges, but I think that we can face that with confidence. And we're very focused on competitiveness and doing it right. So, yes, I think, um, you know, confident going forward. Thank Brilliant. Uh, just I think the, the organiser would yeah, like to uh, just one ask a question. Time for one question, if there is one, please, from the audience. Any question? No? Nope. Then I think we're done. We are done. Thank you very much Thank for listening. Fine. Thank you.